This is the Mosaic of Art. I'm speaking with Peter Boswell, Assistant Director and Senior Curator of the Miami Art Museum, MAM as it's known here, and he has graciously agreed to join me in exploring how a museum functions. Of course, not every museum is the same, and we'll learn something of what makes MAM unique, but certain functions are generally shared, so we'll begin with some of the basics. Thank you for agreeing to join me in this venture, Peter, and welcome to the Mosaic of Art. Thanks a lot. How long have you been at the museum? Uh, I've been here 11 years. Previously, I'd been at the Walker Art Center for 10 years. So mm -hmm. it... How would you compare uh, Miami's arts scene from your previous positions at the American Academy in Rome and the, the Walker in Minneapolis? Well, I, I think uh, Miami's art scene is just far more dynamic uh, than those were at the times when I was there. It's really just in the time that I've been here, in the time that I've been acquainted with uh, Miami since the mid-90s, uh, it's really sort of grown exponentially, uh, blossomed. You came at the right time. Yeah, yeah. I first came here actually when I was uh, in uh, Minneapolis at the Walker and I brought a group here. Uh, and I was pretty impressed by what I saw here. We visited the Della Cruzes and uh, Margulies and things like that and saw some artists. Uh, and then when I came, started to work in 1999, I, I could tell that in just those five years, uh, Things had really ratcheted up. The Rubel collection was here mm -hmm. and everything. And uh, and then uh, once Art Basel came in 2002 and everything, everything just sort of seemed to explode through the roof. That was kind of the steroid uh, <laughs> fix for Miami. <laughs> Absolutely. So it's really been amazing. Um, and we've just, we're just about to close this exhibition, New Work Miami, uh, 2010. And uh, it, one of the really gratifying aspects of that is as we went out on studio visits and stuff to find the number of artists who had moved here uh, recently. Well, let's take a, a, a quick snapshot of the Miami Art Museum. It's uh, What's the physical size of the exhibition space, more or less? Okay, the exhibition space is uh, about 13,500 square feet, and the total museum building is, I think, 33,000 square feet. Right now, the collection is 630 pieces. Well, we just added to it, so it's mm -hmm. probably up around 650. The museum, when it was first built, was called the Center for Fine Arts. It was supposed to be strictly a Kunsthalle, a temporary exhibition space, so it had no facilities uh, to store a permanent collection. And also the, the, the gallery space was geared towards uh, temporary exhibitions, not having a permanent collection and temporary exhibitions. Basically, since we became a museum, uh, we've been uh, looking to move to our own building. And what's the size of the staff? It varies depending on economic circumstances. Yeah. But uh, right now we're about 30 full-time people. I, I said we're so somewhere between small and medium. The, the big news here is that a totally new and dramatically designed and sited museum building is just about to enter its uh, construction phase. Uh, we'll have a couple of years to explore the new building, but could you give just a, the briefest sketch? Yeah, it, it's going to be uh, quite a bit larger than this space. It, it'll have, uh, I think it's 32,500 uh, square feet of gallery space. So well over twice as much gallery space uh, as we have here. And the whole building is, I think, 125,000 square feet, so four times the size of the current building. And that gives you a sense of, you know, some of the sort of back-of-house need mm -hmm. and also, you know, space for a bigger bookstore, space for a restaurant, uh, education facilities. So it's really making up for a lot of our current needs. Mm -hmm. How do you arrive at a size? What, what goes into the process? Well, it, it's a pretty complex process. Basically, uh, the, the sort of nitty-gritty of it is that uh, 
the MAM staff, when we first decided uh, we were going to uh, build this building, when the site first became available and no it was known that uh, we were going to be able to uh, build on it. So from that time, uh, the, the MAM staff basically started putting together what it wanted uh, in its ideal mm -hmm. museum. You know, we worked with a firm who, who has uh, been sort of our liaison guiding us through this uh, process uh, called Paratus Group, just sort of guiding us through the whole mm -hmm. process of thinking about what we need and all that stuff. So we came up with all these features that we wanted. Then we started uh, looking at uh, what we could afford, and, and we, we basically pared it down for, for, to uh, you know, something that was reasonable to be able to expect to do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that became known what was what was known as the program plan. And so, with that program plan, we went uh, and had a, a process for selecting architects. Uh, eventually, the, uh, Herzog and Demuron uh, were selected, and they used that program plan as their basis for uh, developing a building. So, once we had put all that together, we then put a price tag on what that building would cost. Of course, it was more than uh, we had, more than we had uh, budgeted. So we looked at where you could save things, what things mm. were absolutely essential, uh, how you could combine features. Uh, so it's been a long process of sort of uh, paring things down uh, so we get as much as we were looking for uh, within the budget that we have. The groundbreaking is scheduled for when? Before the new year. Well, let's use the current exhibition, which you referred to, the new work Miami 2010, which has been up over the summer as a way of getting a handle on how the staff interacts in creating an exhibition that originates in-house, as, as this one does. How did the concept first arise? We're thinking probably two years ago, you know, thinking about our upcoming schedule and everything. You know, it's part of our mandate to show uh, Miami artists, and we do it regularly in our permanent collection in any show that we organize. We tend to sort of include Miami artists, but periodically we have done shows devoted exclusively to uh, Miami artists, and I think the last one we did uh, was Miami in Transition, which was probably 2006 or so. Yeah. And so as we were looking at the schedule, uh, we were thinking that by 2010, that would have been four years since the last Miami Artist Show, and it would be a good time to do it. You know, I think we sort of staked out the time slot first, and we knew from the start that Renee Morales and I would uh, work together on it. He's the associate curator. Correct. We started uh, basically just researching, thinking about what artists we were interested in showing, going out and doing studio visits, and then sort of uh, within the, the course of doing that, I think we determined uh, that rather than doing a thematic show like we had done with Miami in Transition, which was all about the sort of physical transformation of uh, Miami in the early 2000s with all the building boom and everything, that we wanted this to be uh, something different. Because uh, we were finding, you know, this incredible variety of artists out there that we were interested in. So we gradually uh, moved towards the idea just that it would be new work. That would give us a certain amount of freedom as curators uh, to go out and find the most interesting work we could find. Originally we thought, you know, new work meaning within the last uh, couple of years or something like that. But then, sort of very gradually, we sort of came to, to the decision that new work should be work that had never been shown before. Gradually, uh, as we started discovering the sort of work that would fit in that rubric, we got more excited about it. I got more excited about it. And one of the things that was really uh, uh, rewarding to me uh, was when we finally decided the final roster of artists uh, and told other artists in the show who the other ones were and stuff like that. None of them knew all the others. There, oh, there were new artists for mm -hmm. everyone. And I should, I should say also that one of the things that was important uh, uh, to us was that the show would really be intergenerational. Since Art Basel and everything, everything has been about new, you know. 
and there are a lot of wonderful artists who have been here uh, for a long time that tend to sort of get short shrift because uh, the collectors and everything are out after the artists who are still in high school type thing. Yeah. Uh, so we wanted it to be intergenerational. And so we, we really do have a, a really wide range of artists in there. There's no Miami look. And Renee and I have very different tastes and everything. So uh, this, this really allowed us uh, to go free. Uh, uh, I think each of us sort of found artists that the other one didn't know about mm -hmm. and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in general, I, I think... Uh, uh, Renee uh, has been really interested in uh, what's called uh, relational art, art that is really meant to be interacted with by the viewer. Uh, Jean Moreno okay. and er Ernesto Arosa's installation, mm -hmm. for example, uh, Felicia Carlyle's. So that might be, you know, a tendency that he was uh, pr particularly receptive to, for example. And you? I'm an old fart, you know. <laughs> I probably leaned towards, uh, you know, traditional uh, painting and sculpture more than Rene did. But Not that there's a lot of very traditional work. There, there were certainly painters in there that Rene champions, you know, mm -hmm. so. Did you generate some conceptual models like a certain percentage of video or new commissioned installations? Or was it initially just driven by what you saw in the studios and galleries and that, that jumped out at you? I think it was uh, primarily dri driven by what was uh, in the studios mm -hmm. and everything. And, you know, after we had sort of a core group, we sort of looked and thought about the range of media represented. And, uh, one of the things that sort of surprised us in the end was th the lack of video uh, uh, in the show. And I think part of that was a spatial concern. Well, all along we had wanted uh, the show to be really inclusive, to be really interdisciplinary, so that we knew that we would wanted to have events going on during the run of the show that would give performance artists an, an opportunity to be represented also. And, uh, and we, in the end, we also decided to have a, a sort of video program that uh, we'd show on various occasions. Uh, and different venues. And different venues, right. Okay, so we're standing right now in front of a piece by uh, Robert Teeley, Bob Teeley. Um, and I had known Teeley's work for a long time. He's been active in Miami since the 60s. But I had always known him as an abstract artist. Did sculptures, did paintings, did things that were somewhere between sculpture and paintings. Uh, but everything I had seen was abstract. And then uh, as we were researching this show, Suddenly I started seeing this new work of his that was uh, uh, incorporated media images and usually behind sort of frosted plexiglass so you couldn't quite see what was going on. But this struck me as a, a, a real, it was a real shock and I really loved it. And so we have this work here that's in the show that has this, it, it's got images that's kind of hard, they're hard to identify they're behind this frosted plexiglass, and they have the curious property that the further away you are from the piece, the clearer the images are. And as you come closer to get a better look at what you're looking at, instead it becomes uh, sort of more and more out of focus, more diffuse, until when you're right in front of it, you haven't got the faintest idea what you're looking at. But you can tell from a distance, uh, this piece, that there's a figure in it. And then as we were installing uh, the, the show, this sort of figurative element came out of the show. <laughs> it was that we weren't entirely sure, you know, aware was there. Uh, so there's a big drawing by uh, Christina Peterson of uh, a figure. Uh, in this case, it's Juliet, uh, reawakening from the dead. In graphite, very meticulously done, a uh, very beautiful technique on a, a big sheet of paper. And then near it is a piece by Guerra de la Paz, who work with uh, discarded clothes and everything, and have been doing it for years, sometimes abstractly, sometimes sort of vaguely figuratively. Uh, but this particular piece, which I first saw as they were just 
halfway through making it, uh, is uh, basically looks like some sort of Greco-Roman torso. So where their earlier work, the, the clothing tend to be very loose and draped. In this case, it's all stuffed inside a skin, basically. So it's very taut. Uh, and then across from there are some uh, paintings by uh, Matatamara that feature figures. And, you know, it, it, it was interesting. As we were uh, installing the show, some of these relationships just sort of came out that we weren't entirely aware of. Well, to what degree did you map out the gallery spaces, and to what degree was it a matter of bringing things, wheeling them in, leaning them against the wall, and moving them around? I'd say at least half the show is basically installation-oriented. So really, we had to identify the spaces that those would be in. And then within the space that was left over, sort of, uh, the more object-like works uh, got shifted around quite a bit. But in general, uh, we sort of had a basic organizing uh, principle that emerged from the show. There's one side of the gallery that uh, we tend to uh, refer to as sort of the rock and roll room, work that is often has sort of some sort of uh, imagery from popular culture or eye-catching effect, like the Don Lambert's piece. And then the in kinetic the kinetic piece, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the middle, uh, they tend to be maybe we you'd call them the more formal works, the, you know, the more traditional painting and sculpture. And then um, over on the other side, work that tends to be more sort of about uh, the urban environment. Pieces like Adler Guerrier's, uh, which is all made out of signs that are uh, recovered from the street. Jenny Brillhart, who does uh, sort of map-like uh, plotting of buildings. Uh, so there tends to be sort of a more urban feel to, to uh, that part of the gallery. So th things sort of fell in with each other mm -hmm. rather than us having categories that we jammed things into. Right, and tried to shoehorn the work right. in, into uh, some conceptions. Uh, once we sort of started figuring out that there would be about 25 artists or so, we did say, okay, each of us gets five artists. That, uh, and then we have to agree on the other 15. Mm -hmm. And, and there, were, there weren't any days that you weren't talking to each other. Huh? Yeah, no, no. Um, but, but, you know, but by making a decision like that, whether we actually stuck to those five or not, I think it gave us a latitude and a freedom and gave the show an openness uh, that, that uh, I'm very happy about. You included a number of dramatic performance events, including music and dance, a temporary AM radio station, lectures. How did that come about? Was that new for 